We are live from Texas 2019 at Centara Grand Hotel. I am joined now by one of the most interesting persons in the world and one of soon to be my favorite guests on the program as well, Audrey Tang from Taiwan. Good morning, Audrey. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. So I would have to say Sawadee Cup. Okay. The Thai way. Yeah. Sawadee Cup. Uh, Audrey Tang is a, a digital minister from Taipei, uh, one of, from Taiwan, one of, one of the guests here at Texas. Mm -hmm. So how has it been for you this, Last, the past two days? Uh, I was here Monday and at a conference talking about disinformation. Mm. I'm really happy to be joined by across all the different sectors. And I saw that uh, this is a very interesting topic for Thai people, mm -hmm. uh, especially after the election now. Uh, and so I brainstormed with the civ civic tech societies and the different academics and so on uh, to basically uh, share the Taiwan model of no takedowns, but rather notice and public notice where the social sector can just add to the message instead of taking down any message. And it seemed to be very well received. What's the takeaway that you received out of the discussions that you've had over the past week in I, that, on that topic? On that topic, I think people very much want to trust each other, but they really also want evidence uh, for that trust. Mm -hmm. I think uh, people place a lot of value on trust, just as with Taiwanese society, but people also understand that blind trust uh, is worse than no trust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think uh, it is just this trust-building work that is usually done in you know, post-elections in all societies mm -hmm. uh, that people can learn that if we have the same facts, Different parties, different ideology, kind of different interpretations, but the same facts is essential to keep a society going. When you Google transgender minister, obviously it is you and you and you. Mm. Have, you have you Googled yourself? Have mm. you read your Wikipedia? Have you gone through all the information about you online? Yeah, I, I, I have, of course, but I cannot write to my Wikipedia. Yeah, you cannot write here. No, Wikipedia. no, because it's against the Wikipedia rules. Yes. Yeah, I can fix typos. That's the you, only thing I can do. Do you get to fix typos? Yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, reading about your history, you know, it, it's so inspiring for so many people out mm -hmm. there in the world. And added to the fact that, of course, the gay marriage law has been passed only recently in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. you know, exciting times. It is. For Taiwan. Yes. Tell us more about your thoughts. Because we, are, we thought we were going to be the first, but you guys beat us to the punch. So tell us more about mm -hmm. that. Sure. Uh, marriage equality, I think, in Taiwan is a result of 12 years of mm -hmm. what we call gender mainstreaming in the public sector. For 12 years, all the different policies, national policies, national projects, must pass through what we call impact assessment on gender. So we have a shared gender dashboard. We look year after year, like, for example, the balance of gender ratios in our parliament. In our national parliament, there's now almost 40% women, uh, and the representation is very diverse. We have LGBT councillors, city councillors, and so on. And so um, just by measuring this, by making sure that all the public service has to go through the motion, if they're in the Ministry of Finance, they may think, oh, uh, what does gender have to do with me? But mm -hmm. they have to evaluate their gender impact, even on taxation and on all these um, different policies. And so with 12 years of this kind of work, the mainstream uh, public servant become more accepting. I see. Of the different uh, gender expressions and things like that. Of course, having President Tsai Ing-wen as our president also helps uh, on gender mainstreaming. And finally, at the end, we chose a legalization strategy that legalized the bylaws, that is to say the duties and the rights, instead of the in-laws, that is to say the families. Uh, so in the civil code, there's different sections. Yeah. So in the, our marriage equality law, we hyperlinked, referenced the civil code on all the rights and duties of the bylaws, but leaving the in-laws alone. And so that's made this kind of ingredients work for people with the more conservative generations as well as people with more progressive generations. And the two referendums really express that will very clearly. So... The law came out only a few weeks ago. That's right. That's right. And and the whole nation was celebrating. Oh, very much so. So tell us more about what you saw on that day. Yeah, there was a tweet. <laughs> on May 17, 2019, mm -hmm. in hashtag Taiwan, hashtag love one. 
not win, mm -hmm. we took a big step towards true equality and made Taiwan a better country. That's right. That's from our president, Dr. Mm -hmm. Tsai Ing-wen. How has the mood or the feeling of you know, your community, your country, how has it changed over the past few weeks? Do you feel it's a different air mm. with that law being passed? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I myself posted on Twitter um, of a um, blue sky and a rainbow uh, and basically saying, you know, um, love one and that dreams do come true uh, somewhere over the rainbow. <laughs> and <clears throat> it represents, uh, as I said, very hard work across uh, more than a decade mm. of uh, activists, but also a lot of um, restraint and deliberation by people with different, um, you know, religious beliefs and people with different backgrounds. Um, I think the mood is that we settle on something that we can all live with. And this is very important because in democracy, if you are looking for, you know, beating the other half of the population, every time you have a new law, the society gets divided in half. Yeah. But having this kind of reconciliation talks, having this kind of uh, bylaws but not the in-laws, having this kind of uh, design, it actually made the society go together more mm. because people respect their differences but also understand that we are united in our differences. You yourself, your journey since mm -hmm. you grew up and mm -hmm. being a transgender, what was the turning point in your life? I mean, realizing mm -hmm. that you want to serve your country mm -hmm. and at the same time you need to be yourself legitimately. What was, mm. that? What was that like for you? Well, I'm working with the government. I'm not working for the government. So <laughs> I'm serving essentially everybody, not mm. just um, my country. Uh, but the point here, I think, is more um, white. Uh, it's, I think, by the time that I reached uh, puberty, my first puberty, I went through two puberties uh, in 1996. Um, two I would, puberties? Puber first one was in 19... Uh, first one was around 90, 93 to 94 to 95, okay. and the second one uh, around 10 years later. Okay. Um, and so uh, my first puberty uh, also coincides with me encountering with the Wild Web because the Wild Web was just uh, deployed, right, widely around the world, around the time. And so on the Wild Web, it seems like people generally just don't care about the, the gender, right? Uh, because across the web, nobody can really um, express uh, themselves except by the way that they choose to be expressed. And so it allows far more freedom in experimentation in the different pronouns, different gender expressions, different societies. And by and large, it made me feel not alone because then uh, people with intersex conditions, people like me, uh, born with a lower testosterone level than um, you know, average in males and things like that, um, we may be unique in our community of 100 people, but on the internet, on the right Usenet group, on the right uh, web forums and so on, you can easily see thousands of people having the same uh, lifting experience. Mm -hmm. So the tribe is not just a physical tribe anymore. It is actually an online tribe. Mm -hmm. Instead of being a tribalism, like just talking to people with the same tribe, the online people using hyperlinks made it very interesting and easy to talk with people who don't know much about these things yet. So that's the form of frequently asked questions, right, mm -hmm. or FAQs. So I went online, I saw all those FAQs, and I learned a lot from the international community. And I finally told my teachers, I don't want to go to school anymore mm. because I've been learning so much on so many things directly with people contributing to science, technology, and sociology. And the teachers went through that uh, list of my email correspondences with leading professors, and we co-create papers. They don't know I'm just 14 years old, right? And then my teachers all said, oh, just go with it. And you don't, have go to go, yeah, you don't have to go to school anymore. So, so that really is a very empowering moment. I'm getting goosebumps right now. Mm. I, I heard that your IQ, have you gotten tested? Is it 180? No, it's, it's my um, height. It's one, <laughs> 180 centimeters. 180 centimeters <laughs> the, is your height. Yeah, the, Someone the told unit, me that your IQ is 180. The unit is very important. Okay. For, for, for adults uh, using the waist test, uh, okay. uh, the top is 160. Mm -hmm. Above that, the test has no uh, efficacy. I see. Yeah. Second time that you went through puberty. What That's was that right. Like? What was that? Like? That was uh, around 2005, 2006. 
Uh, so I decided to went through uh, the female puberty, um, hormonal replacement, mm-hmm. all those different um, chemical treatments, and as well as just a change of pronouns online. So it, of course, also widened uh, my mind in a different way. The relationship with the body is different. The body uh, is more sensitive uh, to, you know, the, the gut feelings. It's more connected to the environment, to people around, and so on. Um, and so, yeah, I think those uh, two puberties together gave me a wider range of what the words mean when people talk about their different experiences and also makes me more, um, builds more empathy with mm. people with different life experiences. When people come up to you, mm-hmm. what do they like to talk to you about? What do they ask you, mm. especially the teens or the younger mm-hmm. crowd? Mm-hmm. Right. So um, I have office hours. So my office is open to everyone every Wednesday. So from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., anyone can come to me talking about anything. Um, what I have, to your office? Yeah, to my office. Uh, so there's like a line in front of your office? Hmm, there's a booking system. Oh, there, okay. There's a booking <laughs> system. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Forgot about that. So people come on time uh-huh. and leave on time. Like you get 15 minutes with Andre? Or? You get 40 minutes. 40 minutes. It's okay, very, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, anyone can book my time. And only condition that I have is, is that we must publish the entire transcript or video online. Okay. So this is for the benefit of the public. So it's very interesting because if we don't do radical transparency like this, people will tend to talk about things that are of private interest to them, right? Lobbying, uh, asking favors, and mm. things like that. But because they know that it will be uh, transcribed and published to the internet, they talk about public welfare. So the interesting thing is just by radical transparency alone, it changed the conversation with uh, politicians, and which is why I always encourage my colleagues to try this radical transparency. And so um, the younger people, uh, people around 15 years, years old are the most active actually Uh, they are the most active they are the most active both on the office hours and also on our e-petition platform. Our e-participation platform, join the GOV.TW, has around 5 million uh, visitors out of a country of 23 million people, so one quarter of population. And the people who spend the most time on it are 15 years old and then 65 years old. 15 and 65? Yes. Interesting. Very interesting, because they have more time, I guess, yeah. and also care more about public welfare instead of just private welfare. And so they raise very interesting points. For example, just this year, Taiwan banned uh, the use of indoor drinks with plastic straws, with non-recyclable straws. Mm-hmm. And that was raised a year and a half ago just by a 15 year old girl in the e-petition platform. And um, so it very quickly gets like more than 5,000 signatures and uh, all the environmental protection agency people. So it must be a really senior activist, you know, organizing so quickly. But, but it turns out it's her civics class. Her teacher told the classmates to find something uh, to petition for. And, and then they, they were very active and found the best way to express this kind of uh, movement. And it really turned into policy change. So I think the 15 years are totally died away. What about the elder generation? What, what are they interested in? So the elder generation cares about staying relevant and meaningful in their lives, even if they may be retired. They really want to join a a meaningful um, movement so that they can support uh, the visions set out by 15 years old. And so this kind of intergenerational solidarity is actually mostly what we found as the most successful movements and startups. If you have people who are really young, people who are really old, and also the domain expertise of the stakeholders, if you're working, for example, um, on people with Down syndrome, it helps to have families of Down syndrome people in your board, right, in your uh, board of directors. And these trilingual teams is what we found as most successful to effect social change. Trilingual teams. Yes. So uh, teams that speak the language of the young, language of the elderly, and also the language of the stakeholder that they affect. What language do you speak, Audrey? Uh, JavaScript, (laughs) uh, Perl, uh, Haskell. (laughs) Uh, Are you a nerd? Do you uh, find yourself as a nerd? Of course. Did you you grow up, do people call you a nerd? Of course. Right? You do. I, I did call you a nerd, but I mean, I, I don't think I'm a nerd, uh-huh. but I'm just asking, like, do, have you been called that? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, yeah. the, the South uh, German uh, uh, newspaper just described me a rare nerd with empathy. Rare nerd with empathy. We need more of that in the world. That's right. We need more of that in the world. Mm. Uh, I wonder every day when you wake up. Mm. Now, this is our burning question. Not burning question, but this is our question... Uh, this is the question that we ask all of our guests. It's your routine. Yes. What mm-hmm. is your routine, Audrey? 
Oh, okay. So your routine is asking people what their routines yes, are. Yes, that is uh, my routine. Okay. <laughs> so um, I actually, I'll talk about my evening routine. Okay. So before I go to sleep, I reply to each and every one of the email. I archive my inbox turns zero, uh, and I finish uh, all the to do items, uh, and I just archive everything. So it's a completely uh, empty, uh, free of you know incoming messages by the time that I sleep. And I hold with myself in, in my mind the questions that I'm going to deliberate, the issues that are complex. Um, I listen throughout the day, but I don't come to conclusions. And I just hold these patterns in my mind, and I get to sleep. And after eight hours, I wake up with innovation, with ideas, with solutions, and I write them down. That's my routine. Okay, I just got more goosebumps from that. Mm. I don't know why, but this is very insightful. So you... Clear up everything mm. before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. Your mountains of incompletions have been cleared. Mm -hmm. The issues that need to be resolved are placed inside of mm -hmm. your head. Without judgment. Without judgment. And mm -hmm. you don't judge anything for that entire day too. That's right. Right? You go to bed. Mm -hmm. And then you wake up with conclusions. With ideas. Every day. Every day. Now, how many problems or how many thoughts or how many issues do you take <laughs> with mm. you into bed per night? Like 10 mm. or 15? Or yeah, yeah, and it is easily that, yeah. right? So how many meetings I have, like every day I have six or seven meetings. And so the unresolved issues just pile up without any judgment. And then I wake up with creative solutions. And if these are particularly complex, I may have to work harder mm -hmm. by sleeping nine hours. How many hours do you sleep per night? Uh, eight. Eight. And are you a deep sleeper? Or do you sleep deep? Yeah. Deep? You do? I do. You do. You mentioned about complex issues, and obviously there are different kinds of issues that you have to think about, mm -hmm. right? But not judging the issues at hand mm -hmm. every minute of your life while you're still awake I think that is a challenge in itself. So meaning that before you arrived here mm -hmm. at this age, you used to judge. Have, have, did you used to judge before? Before realizing maybe I should mm -hmm. just not judge? What was that journey like for you? Yeah, I think because I learned programming really, really early on when mm -hmm. I was eight years old, right? So for me, it's like a, um, a musical instrument. I mean, computer. To me, it's like a musical instrument. Um, so the individual notes are logic. And the melodies is the space that allows people to interact. And so I learned it very early on, so much so that it become part of my thought pattern, like computational thinking, <clears throat> as people call it now. But it turns out uh, not everything is looking for a solution. Um, too many people who grow up with programming so that everything can be solved if they just measure it right, if they just digitize it, quote unquote. But actually, the most creative solutions are the ones that are spontaneous, that allows for a different direction that are not yet measured. It's measuring new things in the future. It's not keep measuring the old things. Mm. So I think I slowly came to realizing that when I started working on a new language uh, called Pro 6, uh, it's around 2005, also coincides with my second puberty. And at that time, I discovered that to create a new language is to give um, ideas, the patterns, a different way of expressing, of essentially creating a new culture. And when you're doing this kind of creative work, you cannot think of solutions. You must live with the problems, live with the burning questions mm -hmm. as long as possible until they manifest themselves in a way that delivers the common values. And that is the true way for creation. Sometimes it might take years. That's right. Decades. Decades. Generations. A lifetime. A lifetime. A few lifetimes. <laughs> Some five minutes. That's right. That's but right. you when you know it's when you know the answer's there, mm -hmm. you know it's there. It's ready when it's ready. It's ready when it's ready. What are you going to be talking about today at Texas? Right. So there's two talks, uh, two keynotes I'm going to give. One is about digital social innovation, how to use digital technologies to not just talk to hundreds or thousands of people as we're doing now, right? Mm -hmm. Through live stream, but rather listen to hundreds of thousands of people. So that's the first keynote. Can you give me some takeaways before you go on stage with that? How, how do you do that, Audrey? 
So one of the great thing about the internet is that it enables people to express their preferences in a way that are asynchronous or meaning not at the same time. So, for example, this is a real picture of people's opinions、mm -hmm. when in 2015 Uber first entered Taiwan, and so these are your friends and families on Facebook or Twitter that have a different opinion than you, but they're your friends and families. They're not anonymous、uh, trolls, and we do this by asking people to look at the same facts. And share their feelings. And on the same fact, you can feel happy. I can feel sad. It's all okay, right? So after three weeks of sharing feelings, we say the best ideas are the one that take care of most people's feelings. And so in this way, we can turn it into a new regulation. And so the interface is really simple. You look at one statement. You say you agree or you disagree, and that's it. There is no reply button. Because if there's a reply button, you can attack the person. Field tests of autonomous driving on public roads should have a predictable space and time boundary. That's one of the suggestions. So people would react to that. Yes. How do they feel? So when and they agree,、uh, they move toward the people who also agree. When、okay. they disagree, they move in their avatar to the people who also disagree. And every time we see this shape at the end,、mm. so there may be five divisive issues that are ideological, but people agree to disagree. But if you only look at popular media, you would thought that that's the only thing that society is talking about. But no, actually, people agree on most of the things most of the time with most of their neighbors, and these are the things that we should focus our constructive energy on、mm. and listen by skill. Those different、um, crowd-moderated collective intelligence allows us to have a better agenda by talking about things that we know that people are supporting. And this allows us to find then creative solutions while tabling the more divisive issues. Is this happening every day in Taiwan? I mean, is, are the issues up in the air for people to to talk about,、yes. and discuss? Is it a policy there? Yeah, it is. There is a national policy, actually multiple national policies, that you can start this kind of discussion by five thousand people petitioning, or you can file a sandbox application for your new ideas,、mm. or you can join the presidential hackathon, which is a <clears throat> three months、um, uh, cohort of twenty teams selected. By the people, and、uh, these teams deliver a prototype, and the president gives a trophy to five winning teams every year. The trophy has no money, but it is a projector. If you turn it on, the president herself gets projected, handing the trophy to you. So it's very <laughs> useful for internal negotiations, and it's a presidential promise that whatever you built in the three months become public policy after a year. At most, and so basically, the government would take your ideas, and it becomes part of public service. And that kind of co-creation is the digital way of listening to hundreds of thousands of people and turning their good ideas into public policy. Great idea. Great idea, and the other talk would be about the other talk. I don't know because it、you、will be、know. it will be crowdsourced. Okay, I would just start putting out the QR code,、mm -hmm. asking people to using their phone to ask me questions and vote on each other's questions. What time will that be on?、Um, so just this afternoon. And Uh, the idea, very simply, you guys can check out more by going on the, onto the Take Sauce、yes, page. Yes, it's on the listening at scale, so it's four thirty. Four thirty p.m.、Uh -huh. today. Audrey, take us to twenty twenty. What do you see happening for Southeast Asia, Taiwan, Thailand? You know, in terms of economics,、uh, social discrepancies, in terms of growth. What, what, what do you see? Twenty twenty is just next year. Yeah.、Right? So next year we will see the first deployment of five G technology.、Mm -hmm. We will see that previously、uh, there were many places that were rural that doesn't have good broadband connection start to have a really good like gigabits per second broadband connection. That means that people are going to live and have entertainment, have education, do business, and so on without having to rely on land travel or air travel for that matter.、Uh, we were going to see a regional revitalization where people can go back. To their homes, to their communities, and so on, without having to be on large municipal cities. I mean, part of their time can still be here in the large municipal cities, but many of their time can be, you know, either telepresenting or also, you know, in a virtual classroom to get people from all over the world together and share their empathies, to share their different experiences. Previously, it's very hard.、Uh, you, of course, nowadays using the fastest fiber optic, you can simulate some part of it,、mm -hmm. but then. It's not people's real field experience, but with 5G, people can very easily just put out a virtual reality goggle and then just walk and live with anyone. 
And then that will enable a lot more social empathy with people in different circumstances and enable a new kind of economy where people transcend the physical boundaries. I see the possibility that, let's say, we're talking to, in this room, this screen can turn into New York real time. Exactly. We're looking out the window and it's, mm -hmm. you know, the leaves are, no, it's summertime there mm -hmm. in New York. So, you know, real time. And then I can just swipe and it can be London. It can be Taiwan. It can be Taipei at any time. And at the same time, we can have m more people coming into this room. That's right. Talking to us. Mm -hmm. And do you see people being more stationary mm -hmm. in the future and moving less around the world? What do you see? I think people will choose to spend more time uh, in deeper conversations, just like we are having mm -hmm. here. <clears throat> because what we have with the mobile internet right now is kind of a, a proxy of real human interaction. I mean, it satisfies part of the human need, but you don't get to see the micro expressions, right? With this kind of face-to-face -face conversation, mm -hmm. you know exactly whether you're interested, whether where your attention is, whether I'm speaking too fast or too slow and things like that. But using live stream technology at a this point, even if, uh, you know, uh, 1080p, you don't see those micro expressions. You don't feel the same line of presence. But with 5G, it's actually possible to deliver those micro expressions. Mm -hmm. And so people can form much more emotional bonds over longer distance, whereas before it was just impossible. Last and final question. This is in terms of safety, in terms of caring about your health at the same time, using digital, mm -hmm. using phones, using tablets always on, always in that digital world. What do you see will be required for a person to be okay with all these digital materials around them? I mean, as, a, as an avid user of mm -hmm. technology, where do you find that balance? When do you digital detox? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the most important thing is to be intentional. So I install a um, browser plugin called Facebook feed eradicator facebook feed eradicator it eradicates the facebook feed so if i go to facebook.com i don't see a feed it's gone but i can still use facebook intentionally mm -hmm. you look for a friend it's there you look for a page an event you watch a live stream it's there the only thing that's not there is the non-intentional unpredictable feed mm. that fuels the addiction and so the addictive part is facebook is gone but the intentional parts remain. Once everything is intentional, there's no need to detox because there's no manufactured addiction to social technology. And the fear of missing out, the uncertainty of missing something is gone as well. So just to transform the experience with interaction with technology into something intentional, you know what you're doing and then do it and technology helps you to get there faster. I think that's the healthy relationship in terms of mental health, but also of social health. I wish Instagram would have that button turning that feed line That's off right. and I would just intentionally go in to chat with a friend mm -hmm. about an issue that I have at hand. Exactly. Audrey Tang, it's so inspiring to be talking to you this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Kopkun Krap. Shishia. Shishia. Shishia Wudi. Thanks for watching, everyone. We're going to be going live again with one of the youngest CEO in the world and she's only 10 years old mm -hmm. and we're excited to be talking to her this noon so stay tuned for that have a great lunchtime.